afternoon, everyone. Um, I was quite enjoying that music. It was putting me on a nice vibe. Um, thanks, for, thanks for taking the time out to, to listen to me today. Um, it's, with, I'm not sure if Peter realizes it, but it was actually a, a great lead up into what I've got to talk about, um, specifically the, the tail end of what he, was, what he was referring to, and that was about interventionism, about um, how regulation and wanting to force a particular outcome is something that's become quite pervasive uh, in many aspects and many spheres of, of South African economics. And so this topic that we, we, we're going to unpack today, it looks like a little bit of a, of a dry topic, and, and I'm, going to hopefully, I'm going to hopefully challenge some of the perceptions that you've got on, on both these, these two um, uh, variables, inflation and interest rates, because I sometimes feel that uh, they are indeed a little misunderstood. So we, we're going we're gonna to start off by just talking about the conventions and, and how these things are interpreted pretty much at face value by, by most people. But then I'm going to take you through a small journey and I'm going to give you a practical example of how perhaps we can think about these things a little differently and, and, and why it's important for you to be able to think about these things hopefully in the way that we do. So I, if I've done my job properly, um, by the end of this, perhaps I'm going to have changed, at least at the margin, uh, the way that you guys think about inflation and the way that you think about interest rates. I mean, just a show of hands here, how many of you feel that you have a reasonable appreciation of what inflation is? Okay. Um, and interest rates, I mean, we live with those every day, right? So I think we, we all pretty much understand um, the role that interest rates plays in our lives. Now, how many of you, again, show of hands, um, would favor, more often than not, lower interest rates? Gee, I'm surprised there aren't more hands. Um, so generally speaking... Um, you guys are an exception, but generally speaking, people like lower interest rates. The thing is, they like lower interest rates, not always fully appreciating the role that interest rates play in a particular country or, a, or, or an economy. So I'm going to take you through some of that, and, and I'm going to see if, if your uh, perception of what inflation and interest rates are is a little different by the time, by the time we've, we've uh, finished. So, not that, I would, um, not that I would recommend that you, you, you contact these sources of information, as Jana showed you yesterday. Uh, there's lots of very good information out there. I don't necessarily regard Investopedia and Wikipedia as, as, as two of those. In fact, I do my nut when my, my analysts try to, to uh, tap into these resources to try and find out some information. However, they do serve a very good purpose today. They serve a purpose of, of giving me a pretty good example of what mainstream thinking on inflation is. So there are two, there are two emissions from these two statements. Inflation is the rate at which government is stealing your money. So the money supply was a very astute assessment. <laughs> But there's something else that, that resides in this. And I'll give you another second to just think about it a little more deeply. Yep, so, so um, you, you're quite right in that it reflects a distortion of sorts. And that distortion um, is, is nicely reflected in, in, the, in, in the charts that, that follow. But that distortion um, really is the context that, that I'm referring to. So if I move on um, and we look at the, the, the traditional theories of what causes inflation, quite often when I open up a newspaper, I often find these four things. They come through repeatedly. And it's the kind of thing that makes me cringe. Because it's the kind of thing which... Uh, produces a narrative out there which is so superficial 
and which lands up uh, directing the kind of conversations and interactions I have with my clients, much to my frustration. So quite often, I have to reinvent the wheel every time I have discussions with my clients because whilst this might seem plausible at face value, I'm going to take you through a few slides to show you why perhaps we need to think about these things a little more deeply. So the reason why they think government debt levels are a driver of inflation is because, well, the higher the debt levels, the more the government's got to tax you, and therefore, because they tax you more, therefore, prices have gone up, right? Does that make sense? At a superficial level, that makes sense? I'm going to show you why that doesn't work. Demand pull inflation. Well, what is that all about? Demand pull. That sounds reasonably plausible, doesn't it? I mean, if there's a lot of demand in a country and uh, it's, it's chasing a few amount of goods, surely that's going to lead to inflation, isn't it? At face value, that sounds exactly right, doesn't it? I'm going to show you why you need adequate context to that as well. Cost push. Now, this is a favorite one of mine because we see it in this country all the time. So Rand goes a little bit weaker, oil prices go up. Oh, we've got fuel pump prices are, are rising by another X amount of cents. Oh, it's definitely going to impact on inflation. How many times have you guys read that? In fact, there was an article just a couple of days ago on exactly this. Now, what was the petrol price going up? Some 18 cents or whatever. Well, I tell you what, if you had to take every single one of those articles and you had to add the amount of inflation rates that we should have gone up between when they started talking about this stuff and today, we'd be sitting at an inflation rate a good 5% higher than we are right now. So that clearly doesn't quite give us the answer that we're looking for. So cost push doesn't quite work. And then there's the big old favorite, the exchange rate. So now this is something, and I've got a bugbear with the central bank about this because they quote it in the MPC almost every single time oh, well, we've got to uh, be a little bit cautious with our monetary policy because we're concerned about the currency. Well, okay, you can be concerned about the currency. I am too. Uh, it's something very close to my heart. But exactly what is a currency? A lot of people treat a currency as this variable that needs to be managed. It's this variable that leads to and necessarily causes inflation. And yet, I don't see it that way at all. How about if I told you that a currency was maybe just the flip side of the inflation coin? How about if I told you that inflation and the rand were literally different sides of the very same coin? How about if I told you that if inflation was rising to reflect the destruction of purchasing power of every rand you have in your pocket, or the rand was weakening to reflect the same thing, how about I challenge your thoughts on what the currency is, and at this point, it's the first challenge I'll throw out to you to say that perhaps we don't understand what a currency actually is. A lot of the time, people don't appreciate the comments that I make when I tell them that both inflation and a currency are in fact a consequence of something far deeper. And what is that far deeper, what is that far deeper um, appreciation and understanding? Well, it very much revolves around um, the way that we understand monetary economics. I'm going to get to that, park that for a second, because I'm going to come back to it. So moving on. Now I'm going to give you a sense of how we think about inflation and the inspiration that we draw from Mises. Okay, so the first thing that I'd like you to just read, take a second to read, is what Mises understood about inflation. The notions of inflation and deflation are not praxeological concepts. In other words, they are not, in simple English, linked to human action, human behavior. They were not created by economists, thank goodness for once, I'm off the hook, but by mundane speech of the public and politicians. Now, 
leave the public out of this because that's not my beef. But the politicians, as Rob will well know, um, I'm, I'm known within my company for my huge dislike of politicians. And it's a stand-up joke when I walk in and the markets have moved and I tell everybody how much I hate politicians um, and that they must please go and figure out who said what because something's just happened. Well, something usually happens. Um, and, and sometimes uh, there are a lot of, of background rationale and, and reasons for why that thing has happened, but it doesn't often have to do with a whole lot of good. Um, so, so we have this, this uh, environment that gets created by a political construct, if you like, and it suits the politicians to be able to talk about concepts such as inflation. And I'm going to show you, I've got a list of the reasons why uh, that will follow. But getting on to the more hardcore definitions of inflation, and, and to this gent's uh, point a little bit earlier, about one of the core things that was missing, aside from context, uh, discussion about and understanding uh, money supply and monetary economics is absolutely imperative. So just take a look at this for a second and, and specifically focus on from here, read on. Inflation, an increase in the quantity of money that is not offset by a corresponding increase in the need for money. You would have heard in uh, Peter's first day, he was talking about uh, the usefulness and the utility of a particular good. In this case, we're talking about uh, the usefulness and the, the, the utility of, of that money. So the fall in the objective exchange value of money must occur. In other words, what has he basically said here? When you've got quantity of money that exceeds the need for money, you have a destruction in the exchange value of money. Deflation is effectively the exact opposite. But he draws, Mises draws very strong conclusions that actually what we're talking about here is a monetary phenomenon. We need to think about inflation as a monetary phenomenon. And in the same way that he talks about the exchange value of money, He's also referring, in a sense, to the exchange rate. It's kind of what I was trying to describe to you up front when I was talking to you about inflation and the currency being different sides of the same coin. This is what we're referring to. So let's take you through inflation in a nutshell by George, and effectively it's the destruction of, of nominal purchasing power of every note you have in your pocket, Prices are rising relative to your, your salary, and the rand is effectively depreciating over time. Now, why is it important to understand um, these monetary dynamics? Well, I'm going to, if you permit me, a very crude analogy. So we've got an economy, and let's just say, for argument's sake, that this economy has a bucket of money that's attributed to it. Okay, this bucket of money, as you can see here, is fixed. There's no more money attributable to this particular economy, so that bucket stays as is. Let's, for argument's sake, say that we do get a rand weakening. Let's say the economy of South Africa, and we do get a rand that weakens, and we get an oil price that spikes. Okay, so we got a nice big hit in terms of the rand price of fuel. Now, it's a non-discretionary item. We all have to purchase fuel, right? So out of this bucket over here, what do you do? You effectively have to take more out of this bucket than you did a month ago because that non-discretionary good has gone up, right? Now, if the logic that you often pick up in the press was entirely true that should lead to inflation. Except that what's happened, because you've taken a bigger chunk of, of this money out of this bucket, by definition, you've got less left for the rest of the economy, right? So in other words, for the rest of the economy to survive on less money in this bucket, what do they have to do? 
They've got to reduce their prices, not? Otherwise, it just doesn't add up. Ironically, you have that big hit on fuel, but you have no inflation. Why? Because what you gave away in one part of the bucket, you gained in another part of the bucket. Move on to your second bucket. This one's got a tap. It's a magical tap that pours out money. I wish I had one. This particular instance is now slightly different because you have the same hit. The rand weakens, oil price rises. Except that this time, you have a bucket that's constantly gaining more money. With each passing day, it's gaining more money. Now you go to that bucket and you take out the amount of, of money you need for your non-discretionary expenditure on fuel, and guess what? You still have more or less the same amount of money that you had before for the rest of the economy. Why? Because you've got money pouring into the bucket. The net result is if you have a look at the average of those prices across that economy, and you add up the increase in the fuel plus, you add up um, all the other prices, you get to a positive number, don't you? Your prices have increased across the economy. It's a pretty simple analogy, but a pretty powerful one to make the point that Mises was alluding to, that monetary dynamics play an important role. So the conclusion here is that inflation will only be allowed to manifest if the backdrop allows it to, Demand pull, alluding to the earlier chart, is very much a function of the credit cycle. People automatically just assume that demand, uh, and I don't know if you remember uh, Peter's slide on day one about those two guys under the palm tree, um, and the one guy was saying, well, we just need to generate demand. Um, you know, a very a very famous Keynesian type approach, just generate demand, the rest will take care of itself. Well, it doesn't just function that easily, especially not in an economy, in a modern day economy that works on fractional banking, where money supply does get created on a continuous basis. So this is very much a function of the credit cycle. And cost push, well, depending on what your growth in money supply looks like, cost push can often be can often lead to little more than a substitution effect or a compromise. In other words, if the money simply doesn't exist to be able to sustain an expensive good, you will default to perhaps a cheaper alternative, or perhaps you'll forgo it altogether and rather spend that money somewhere else where you'll get utility. It might not match the full utility, but you'll get some utility out of that. Let's try and give this to you in a real-life example. And, of course, I had to use administered price inflation because it's the one that comes up very often in my role, in my job. And people constantly say to me, ah, you know, these inflation numbers are rubbish. George, I can't believe it. Have you not seen what's happened to the rates and taxes? I can't believe that electricity prices are going up double digits again. And now it's the water. And then they went and raised the value of my property, and now you're telling me that inflation's at at under 4.5%. That's not even remotely possible. Come live in my world and you'll see that you know, these numbers aren't true. And I tell them, well, <laughs> you know, I sympathize because I have to sit with these things myself. Um, but that has, in effect, been what's happened um, at an administered price level. And yet, when you have a look at headline inflation, look at what's happened. So headline inflation's gone down. Core CPI has gone down, and yet, as a trend, administered price inflation has gone up. So what's going on here? How is that possible? Is it perhaps because our money supply growth isn't all that strong? And indeed, when you have a look at money supply growth, and we, we cyclically smooth these things just to make them look a little easier to digest, but we've got a three-year percentage change, three-year and three-year percentage change, have a look at the strength of this, this business, uh, of this um, inflation cycle in the bottom half of this chart. The peak of this monetary cycle corresponds to the troughs 
of the previous cycles. That's how weak it was. This is how weak it was, and it's tapered off. Is it any wonder that we're sitting in an environment where, well, the RAND has proved a lot more resilient than people thought? Um, you know, if you think back to the tail end of 2015, um, do you guys remember that we touched 17 bucks to the dollar? You know, we're talking about levels of 15, 20 being weak, but we somehow forget that we came, we came quite a long way off the 17. Um, so, so Rand has, if you pull back the lens and look at it holistically, it's been a little more resilient than people anticipated, but equally, inflation has surprised a lot of people to the downside. And it's been something that the Reserve Bank has consistently got wrong over the past two and a half years. And why have they gotten it wrong? Well, I certainly believe that they don't pay enough attention to the monetary dynamics that drive inflation. So it's not, by the way, just the failure of the central bank. There's been a colossal failure in the private sector forecasting fraternity as well. So they're not alone, but that doesn't make it right. Now, you're going to ask me, well, geez, are you guys so brilliant that you figured this out? Well, no, not really. Uh, you know, are we just, we just following basic principles of a more Austrian-minded um, framework which we think gives us a far better appreciation of what's really going on. So if I had to try and now push this through into some sort of guidance as to you know, what this might look like going forward, what do I do? Well, if I'm giving my clients guidance, I, I capture three things. I try and capture asset prices. And, and why do I look at the, the Aussie? Well, very simply put, it's a financial market instrument that gives me an insight into asset prices. I'm going to touch on asset prices a little bit later, by the way. Uh, and, and I can get that price right now. So that ratio perhaps gives me a little bit of a lead on what's happening at inflation. I look at pricing power. That's very much a, a monetary variable construct where we look at, for example, the differences between um, uh, producer inflation and consumer inflation, and we, we, we look at that in the context of the existing monetary environment, and of course, we look at the trade-weighted rand. Why? Because, again, it's a financial market instrument that I can read right now, I can get a price right now. Um, inflation is subject to logistics, it's subject to uh, leads and lags. Um, once, once the goods are purchased, they then get transported from transported to a warehouse. They then find themselves to the retailer. At the retailer, they sit on the shop um, uh, on the shelves for a while. And so there's a there's a lag of about seven months, which is a wonderful opportunity for me because it gives me an insight into what inflation might do. And so what is our model telling us? Well, once we get past this little, little hump that we've got over here, we're back into a deflationary environment, disinflationary environment rather, not deflationary, a disinflationary environment. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because if you guys in business are trying to figure out how to position yourselves going forward and where you think the opportunities might lie, it matters a great deal. If you are leveraged, you want to know what interest rates are going to be doing. You want to know, if you're going into your wage negotiations, what sort of price pressures you're going to experience in your income statement. These things are important to understand, but I don't want you to understand them in the conventional sense like you do when you pick it up out of a newspaper. I want you to understand it in this sense, because it's a far better proven approach to understanding inflation. And I guarantee you that it's going to give you better perspective in your scenario planning than simply focusing on the way that headline inflation gets captured elsewhere. And just before we get too hard on the Reserve Bank, I, I thought it was important just to highlight that actually the central bank, insofar as central banks are concerned, is doing a reasonably good job. And how do I know that? Well, we rank them. So we, we have these constructs that we've produced, um, fiscal rectitude, we have a whole bunch of fiscal metrics that we, that we capture, that we, um, uh, that we collect and, and um, aggregate in, in a particular indexated way. These are all scores out of 10, by the way, across all three, um, all three columns or all three buckets. 
Um, and, and we try and run it consistently across all these different countries to give us a relative sense of how South Africa is indeed performing. Is it performing well? Is it performing poorly? Well, it doesn't, it shouldn't surprise you that we third from last in a very bad neighborhood um, of Brazil, Mexico, and Turkey on the fiscal front, but look at how well we're doing up here. Um, just Colombia and Mexico above us on, on the monetary front. And why? Well, because... Interestingly, we are quite conservative as a central bank compared to many other central banks out there. Now, not that uh, conservatism in itself is, is something just naturally to reward. Uh, it has more to do with um, conservatism in the context of imbalances that exist in an economy. If the imbalances aren't there, it means, or if the imbalances are small, in the context of a particular monetary environment, it means that, well, to some degree, the central bank may have gotten it more or less uh, better than many other central banks that are operating at the bottom here. Turkey is a case in point, and I'm going to come back to Turkey, but you'll see just how poorly Turkey ranks. They get a score of 0 0.3 out of 10, uh, which, is, which, is a pretty shocking, uh, which is a pretty shocking score. Um, our three-year average, by the way, is seven. So that we are trading slightly above that tells you that we've actually been consistently good for a while. So now mainstream dogma. How do central banks generally behave? Well, central banks like to target inflation. It's regarded as best practice. What they like to do, um, and this is more the developed market uh, 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 central banks, they like to target a 2% inflation rate. Now, I try to figure out why 2%. What a random number. Uh, the South African Reserve Bank is effectively, well, they started off with a 3 to 6% range, but now it's down to the 4.5% midpoint. Equally random. Why? You know, why 2%? Why 4.5%? Um, and I scratched and went through a whole bunch of, of documents and read papers by the Federal Reserve, and the best that I could find was the following, that they like a little bit of inflation, but not too much inflation. Um, how, again, they got to a 2% figure, I don't quite know. Um, I didn't see any mathematical calculation that, that got me to this 2% mark, but apparently... Um, Losing purchasing power slowly in your currency is better than losing it fast, which I guess I would agree with, but it's just somehow not as good in my book as just not losing purchasing power at all. Uh, but we're okay with losing a little bit of purchasing power, um, and I guess at some level it's, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a relative game, right? I mean, if others are losing purchasing power faster than you, well then, you know, in the race to the bottom, you kind of, you're not winning that race. So that's, I guess, a good thing. Um, it helps avoid deflation, the dreaded D word. My word, if you had to read some of the literature about deflation, you'd think it was, uh, you know... Um, the devil incarnates come back to terrorize us. Uh, imagine the horror. Imagine the horror of, of uh, you know, being able to buy things cheaper in the future. I mean, who on earth would want that? I mean, I'd hate that. Imagine uh, being able to walk into a shop and, and buying something at a discount. And gee whiz, I, I, no, I, I definitely wouldn't want that. Um, and, and yet, deflation gets a really, really bad rap. The idea here is that with deflation, of course, we're all going to just not purchase anything because, um, yeah, well, it's, if, I, if I wait another week longer, it's going to be even cheaper. Well, let me ask you this. Show of hands. Who held back on buying a TV in the past 10 years because it was going to get cheaper in a month's time? Who held back on buying a, a, a cell phone because it was going to be cheaper in a month's time? or a computer for that matter? Is there any one single person that can tell me they genuinely held back on buying these goods because it was going to be cheaper in the future? Well, lo and behold, that is a very common response. I haven't found a person yet that waits for these things. So deflation, um, you know, I mean, there's, there's this dogma out there that just says it's, it's a really bad thing. Well, I would tend to disagree, but it's one of the reasons why they think 2% is better than 0%.
Therefore, uh, they believe that because we now get to encourage spending, that we can help generate demand. This is a, a beautiful Keynesian concept. Generate demand. Everything else just resolves itself. Just generate demand. And so it gives you a little bit of perspective as to why we've got this inherent bias in modern economics to just drop interest rates. Just fiscally spend everything um, and, and just... You know, go and, and blow the, the, the household silver just so that we can spend a little bit more because we can apparently spend ourselves into prosperity. Um, it melts away debt levels. Now, this is an interesting one because they know it and we know it. Okay, that's why a lot of us choose to buy things like homes or we choose to buy things like stocks or bonds, although less favorite, but we choose to buy assets. Why? Because through the course of time, um, they get rendered effectively because why they have intrinsic value, they get rendered uh, more and more valuable through the course of time as time goes on. But equally, if you're a government and you are up to your eyeballs in debt, actually a little bit of inflation helps you along. Why? Because it destructs the value of that debt. Remember I told you in the, well, I showed you that, that quote from Mises that spoke about uh, the political imperative that sits behind inflation and the reason why uh, this, this is just as much a political construct as it is a monetary construct. Partly it's as a result of, of wanting to melt away, melt away debt levels. It also boosts nominal tax collections, which guess what? allows a politician to stand up there and tell the populace that they are going to spend a little bit more on this or on that. They, don't, they hardly ever will tell you what the real spending increase is. They'll tell you what the nominal number is. Okay, they don't give you the real number because it doesn't look as impressive. So to be able to tell you that they're going to spend another billion on a road or another billion on something else, well, that sounds a hell of a lot more impressive well, than just a couple of hundred million because actually once you adjust for inflation, it's not that much. Um, but that's what they do. And it erodes real wages. Now, this I found interesting. Why, why would you put this as a positive? Well, if, if, you, if you want to give the impression that, um, or if you want to make in, rea in reality um, uh, labor less expensive to, to your private sector, then a little bit of inflation actually helps. Because why? Because prices are increasing relative to your, um, relative to, to the salaries that you pay. And so what does it do? Well, you know, it helps you at the margin because remember, companies can adjust their prices the whole way through a year. Salary increases don't happen quite as often. So it lends this credence to the idea of central control. Now, just a very basic chart, don't read a whole lot into this, but really I want to challenge the way that people think about, about interest rates. So it's quite amazing to me that we're quite comfortable talking about the market for cars or the market for tomatoes, okay? Market for tomatoes, let's take something a little more abstract. And in that market for tomatoes, we'd be quite comfortable talking about the clearing price being where the, the seller of tomatoes and the farmer um, get to agree on a price that suits both of them. It's good enough for the farmer because it makes him sustainable and it's, it's great for, for the purchaser because he can now have his Greek salad. Wonderful. Um, the market clears, it's nice and efficient and, and happy days. Somehow, the rules got changed dramatically when it came to money. Money doesn't operate that way. Okay. There's no such thing of suppliers of money and demanders of money. Well, there is such a thing, but sitting in the middle, we have this, this construct called the central bank. And guess what the central bank does? It turns around and says, no, guys, guys, hold on a second. We know more than you. And we've decided that it's actually better if we lower the price. So if we lower the price, you, Mr. Farmer, are going to get far more sales, and, and you, the buyer, are going to get a cheaper, 
are going to get a cheaper um, tomato. The problem is, of course, that it doesn't always work out that smoothly. You drop the price, and even if you, if you get it just a little bit wrong, the farmer goes bankrupt because he's no longer sustainable, and you have what they call market failure. Think back 10 years. There was a colossal market failure. Can you guys think what it was? Global financial crisis. That global financial crisis was a colossal market failure. And now you've got to ask yourself, well, what was behind that? Yes, okay, we've, we, we, we read a lot about greedy banks that went and packaged a whole bunch of things that um, didn't look good and whatever. But to Peter's point a little bit earlier, how much of that was interestingly the construct of regulation in the first place? Regulation made the rules, they made an incomplete set of rules, people found ways to circumvent those rules, and all of a sudden we had a little bit of market failure. But over and above that, not just the regulation, but we had a central bank that reduced interest rates so far, it became so absolutely enticing for everybody to own the American dream that they all went out to buy a house. And how did that end? So people that couldn't afford houses suddenly were able to purchase houses. I don't know if you guys watched, uh, there was a fascinating program, um, um, and I think you might still be able to pick it up on Netflix. Um, it, it was about uh, the doping scandals um, that took place, and, and primarily they, they, focused a lot on, they, they focused a lot on cycling. Icarus was the one, there was another one. Um, but I'll, it'll, it'll come to me. But I th Icarus will make the point in any event. Um, and and so, so ultimately, what happened? Well, the regulators, in all their wisdom, came out and told the cyclists that your EPO levels, we're going to monitor them because we think you guys are cheating. Okay, so anything above this 50 EPO level reading, uh, you guys are in trouble. What they effectively did was gave the cycling teams a green card to cheat all the way up to 50. Just stop there. It was the birth of dragging in sport. They didn't ban it outright. If we catch one little, little instant incidence of this in, in your body, you're going to be gone. No, 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 it was 50 because that was deemed an appropriate level. The regulators knew better. And it resulted in another form of market failure. So what am I talking about here? Well, we've got the situation, and Peter was alluding to it, and, and that's why I said this is a great lead-up to my, to my presentation, because he alluded to regulation, manipulation, interventionism by policymakers and, and, and government, generally speaking. Interest rates are now seen as a growth driver. They're not seen as the price of money. Remember, in the tomato market, Buyers and sellers would hook up at a particular price. Money can't do that. Money can't do that. Okay? It cannot behave as a natural price, which is all an interest rate actually is. The price gets forced down in a way as to distort a potential outcome, which to their mind would be a positive outcome. And so interest rates are seen as a growth driver, the ability to force an outcome is just too enticing to ignore. So when things have not gone particularly well, don't worry about it. We'll just reduce interest rates, and we'll sort all of that out and, and generate the growth, the growth. We must generate the growth. Unconventional policy now is as popular as ever in avoiding the R word, which is recession. So what's happened? So we've had developed markets drop their interest rates pretty much to zero. In fact, they've gone way further. So Japan's negative, um, uh, the ECB's negative, um, and, and others are not far off. Uh, so, so your interest rates have been dropped all the way down to the floor, um, and monetary corruption, unfortunately, is something that's been encouraged rather than being dissuaded. Now, if you want to know what monetary corruption ultimately looks like, 
Well, let's just take an extreme case, and we look at Belarus, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Ghana, and you have a look at what happened to their currency um, after they lost all monetary discipline, and you find that these currencies were worth only a fraction of what they were um, three years prior to that. But even if I take something less dramatic and something more recent, and let's have a look at Turkey, for example, and remember Turkey ranked right down at the bottom, they got 0 0.3 out of 10, well, let's just look at what Turkey did. So any, any ideas as to what Turkey did over here to result in this? Turkey's president, in his infinite wisdom, decided that interest rates were the enemy of the people. Quote, unquote. Enemy of the people. So he decided to drop interest rates. Well, he saw America doing it, so like, why can't we? I mean... What makes them special? I, you know, I also want to do the same thing. So it dropped the interest, interest rates very aggressively. The market structure simply couldn't tolerate it. Um, they had a big, massive blow-off in their exchange rate, and it happened in a very short space of time. So you went from 3.5 to 6.5, literally in the space of six months. And guess what happened to their inflation? It spiked north of 25%. And guess what they were forced to do after that? Amazingly jack up the interest rates aggressively because it was the only way that they were going to be able to restore any form of balance. But that monetary corruption is endemic. It's happening absolutely everywhere at the moment. And if you want to know just how bad the situation's become, I picked up a chart of Bloomberg, which speaks about the market value of negative yielding bonds has now reached the level of $17 trillion. Let that number sink in for just a second. $17 trillion is trading negative, bond yields negative. Imagine, imagine taking money out of your back pocket and giving it to a government in the knowledge that you're going to get less back from them. Imagine a government being able to borrow and being paid for borrowing by yourself, and you would be willing to do that. Imagine that for a second. It's an aberration. It's an aberration, but it's an aberration that exists almost permanently at the moment. So, as Peter also alluded to, sometimes in these modern-day economies, we take decisions, but we don't fully appreciate the longer-term consequences of a lot of our actions, and yet those consequences can be quite profound. So when we have a look at trying to identify some of these, and I don't have uh, much more time with you guys, so I've got to wrap up now, but um, I try to piece together one or two to, just to give you an idea of what, we, what we're talking about. And the most powerful one was this. So I indexated um, equity prices um, to inflation. Now, you would expect in a particular economy to, for the two to move reasonably closely together. And in fact, that, that relationship sort of held if you, if you consider irrational exuberance that happened over there uh, and, and, you, and, and the housing... A bubble that took place over there. These were periods of overinflation, but it corrected almost back to that inflation line. But then look what happened after that. This is when the Fed decided to open up the monetary taps, and they went mad in a way that I never thought I'd see in my lifetime, but they went and effectively just bought bonds, and they built their balance sheet up from under a trillion to over four and a half trillion and they did that in the space of just a few years. They pumped all of that money into the system. That money had to go somewhere. Where, where did it go? It went into assets. And it's not that they went only into equities. It went into bonds. It went into artworks. It went into classic cars. It went into rare animals um, on game farms. It went into the most bizarre places. But it basically went where people felt comfortable in identifying intrinsic value. They've tried to um, normalize, in inverted commas, because that's the sum total of the normalization. They dropped it by 800 million. Um, but in so doing, they also went and, and tightened up monetary policy throughout the globe. It resulted in a very big tightening in monetary dollar liquidity. Um, and the net result is that the Fed didn't, wasn't able to stay that course. They've decided to turn the corner and start cutting interest rates again. Why? Well, because we're going back to the same old process that 
we went through and we lived through uh, in 2008, 2009, 2010, where central banks were used, pull the lever, get monetary stimulation into the system, try and generate demand so that we don't get a big all-fall-down scenario. Because remember, if that demand disappears, and suddenly the fiscal numbers turn very, very sour, the situation looks a whole lot more ugly. So the distortions are now pervasive throughout the economic system. It's not just about distortions in asset prices, it's distortions in the fiscal space, it's distortions in just about everywhere you look. It's become increasingly difficult for rational economic actors, and by that I mean business people such as yourselves, to make good decisions. And guess what happens when they can't? They just don't. Is it any surprise that South Africa's growth looks as weak as it does right now? Why? There's so much uncertainty. People can't make rational decisions, and it's a natural consequence. So, to give you a sense of, of, of what I'm looking at uh, in terms of, of inflation in South Africa and, and the repo rate, after all that's said and done, and through all of our appreciation and understanding of inflation and interest rates, we ultimately arrive at at this scenario where, well, that's where repo sits at the moment. This is where our inflation risk indicator that you saw in a previous chart, by the way, I've just reproduced it uh, with the repo rate uh, added in it. And it's effectively telling us we could get another one or two rate cuts to come. Um, that's ultimately the best guidance that I'm going to give you. But I hope that more important than this little bit, this little tidbit of of, of, of guidance on inflation is perhaps more a different appreciation of how we like to think about inflation, interest rates and the RAND. And if I've managed to just change your mindset just a little bit, uh, to think about these things a little more deeply and to not treat what you see in the newspapers as face value, then my job's been done. Thank you very much. Hartelijke welkom bij Sakenplein. Sake wat? Goeie vraag. Ek sal verduidelik. Sakeplein is eindelijk baie eenvoudig. Dit is een marktplein online. Lees jou bezigheid, lok nieuwe klante, kry sakevernote, kom by mekaar in sakekamers en nog baie meer. Om te sien wat Sakeplein en sy mense vir jou kan doen, registreer vandag jouself of jou bezigheid op sakeplein.com. Sakeplein. Skepwaarde maak wins.